This is a reading from Duplicity and Duress, Not Factories in the Making, by Aaron Vans, my pseudonym. And I'll be reading from Chapter 9, which is Day 5, Do You Like Your Independence? Saturday, January 29th, 2011. Before the chapter, I have a little excerpt from another book, so I'll read that, and then I will begin the chapter. Do you see what he just said? said Bob Hare, a researcher talking about a very serious criminal who was jailed. He moved his car to the right below the panic button on the wall. He did it to intimidate my researcher, who's standing behind the camera. Just a little display of control. This excerpt is from The Psychopath Test by John Ronson regarding an interview between a researcher and quote-unquote case study H a prisoner who kept needing to have control over people, regardless of the situation. So day five, do you like your independence? Saturday, January 29th, 2011. Just keep playing along with this game. That's what a woman said while passing me by as I walked home after finishing up with Murda at the Lazia that Saturday morning for a dog walk. She flew up the steps to what must have been her home somewhere between the cross streets of Lombard and either 22nd or 20th streets. She was tall and lean with athletic build, and she sported a short haircut under a red baseball cap. She gave me a quick, sharp look as she ascended the stairs, but her message felt more like a command for the good, not necessarily a command for the bad, causing me to believe that maybe this experience, as painful as it was, was for an important reason that could be beneficial in the long run that playing along with this game was the way to go for the time being because something much bigger was afoot. Maybe something that could help save me or others. The streets were mostly empty of people at the time, desolate and scarce. Winter hibernation was in full bloom and for sure the greater populace had resigned to it, cozied up under their down comforters while coffee brewed in their kitchens. The woman's comment would end the first flurry of activity to occur already that morning, the morning of day five. Here's how the morning events went down. Almost an hour before encountering the runner, a different woman crossed my path. She was not athletic at all, rather she was quite robust and very dramatically slipped and fell on a snowy sidewalk opposite and just east of the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia on Chestnut Street between 22nd and 21st. This ar was around the corner from the Muter Museum and midway along Chestnut. Turns out the building opposite the Unitarian Church is an evangel evan evangelical Lutheran Church of the Holy Communion. I checked during one of my explorations in a quest for answers. That's where Murda and I were walking at the time. we just reached the far eastern end of the spiritual edifice, the Unitarian Church, and saw the woman fall. She was an older lady of slightly taller than average height who was weighed down by a heavy, long, faded purple winter coat. She walked with a cane, partially hunched over. Ooh, she yelped as her feet gave way underneath her. Not another soul was around. <coughs> Just the woman, me, and Murda. The drama registered as artificial, that she faked the fall. I didn't want any parts of it. To go over to her would be satisfying this peculiar game with so many creepers and fake orchestrated people walking around. But my conscience got the best of me. The woman half rolled from one side to the other like a turtle tossed to its shell. Squish sounds could be heard as her backside crushed the salt into the snow and ice. I couldn't leave her there, unable to return to her feet, so I rushed to her aid. She thanked me for helping her up and shuffled her way west as we, Murder and I, ventured east. That is precisely when the cars began stalking again. Only this time, it was one car at a time, and all of them were the same make and model, not a flash mob of many different cars all at once. They were spaced out as if rolling off a very large invisible assembly line. One 2011 Dodge Challenger, and then another 15 seconds later, and then another. I say they were Dodge Challengers with much certainty, however, there are four types of cars donning similar design and style. The Dodge Challenger, the Dodge Charger, the Chevy Camaro, and the Ford Mustang. 
Since 2011, so many Challengers, Chargers, Camaros, and Mustangs have driven past my view. My memory has been, it seems, intentionally confused. Well, some everyday citizens have innocently been driving one of these models around without realizing it, realizing how it feeds my brain, others haven't been so innocent. An attempt to confuse my recollection was launched. An ambush to confuse my recollection, a recollection about a lot, a lot of things is a better explanation of a multitude of activity to occur since 2011. Anyway, there's just been so many of these muscle cars around, it's ridiculous. Just say a Dodge Challenger were important in a criminal case. But if you have so many cars that look similar and they've passed by your view, that would sort of change up your story and you wouldn't be able to say for absolute certainty what make and model a car was. Many of these types of cars have even been suspiciously parked in locations along my dog walks. Enough so that it became obvious the prime witnesses in the shakedown, me, <laughs> or the prime witness in this shakedown, me, would begin to doubt my very own memory. Most importantly, these cars would appear intimidatingly during a drive down to Midstone, Maryland, a trip I felt pressured to take, one I had to take in order to satisfy the seeming powers that be. I'll talk more about that drive later in the chapter on Neil, but I've rested on the Challenger as the style of cars creeping around on this day because that is the model sticking out in my mind as V1. A Challenger trolled up 21st Street with dark tinted windows and a deep guttural muffler sound. Another crept behind Murder and I while on Market Street, then one appeared on 22nd and later on Arch before I looped back around to drop off Murder to her home. Afterwards, more of these menacing vehicles would wrap around the city blocks that I trekked alone, crisscrossing at street intersections just as I walked through them. These bullish cars with their sinister looking grills, deep throat mufflers, and headlights resembling beady little eyes consistently appeared at, at very crucial moments throughout this experience, as I mentioned. One of them, a deep black Challenger with tinted windows and red hubcaps, even crept beside me as I hoofed it home down 21st Street toward Walnut, where, in watching me as if I were fresh if, as if I were fresh tail in the red light district. <laughs> um, sorry, let me read that again. Uh, watching me where, in the mirrors of the tanning booth spa, I detected the reflection of the driver watching me as if I were fresh tail in the red light district. The tanning booth spa had since been transformed into a German bake shop, which seems a little apropos considering the Nazi-like treatment I had been witnessing and receiving tanning spa or German bake shop. I mean, what's the difference? One could argue the vehicles were motoring around for the annual car show in Philadelphia, which might have been happening at that time. But if that were the case, why only 2011 Dodge Challengers? And why at 8.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning in heavy ice and snow conditions? These Challengers and their routes during these Saturday morning hours along the quiet empty streets appear to be operating in an orchestrated and choreographed way. Sort of like the accusation that Chris Christie arranged in a tra arranged, sort of like the accusation that Chris Christie arranged a traffic jam on that bridge in New Jersey. That it was completely coordinated. Believe what you want. You have the right, but it was weird. I was intimidated, and these cars, these cars were choreographed. I glanced up high into the sky to take note of where surveillance cameras were affixed to buildings looming over street um, corners, all entrances to businesses and restaurants and over church and synagogue doors. For a second, it felt as though we all lived in a life-size movie set with a director who wasn't screaming on a bullhorn nearby but hidden somewhere in some base command style room high up in a tower where no one could see. There was one more incident that Saturday morning before returning home which, I le which left an everlasting impression on my deeply sensitized brain. Three people and a dog. There were three people who were conversing near a corner I passed on South Street. Their voices projected far and wide. One of them, a balding, slightly built man, was walking his pit bull and made a reference to his dog. But his reference to the dog was absorbed by me as me being the dog. It is difficult to explain why, but I'll try. 
The day before, I'd witnessed a man and a woman who kept pointing at me saying, look at the dog, look at the dog, to their child. There was no one else around at that moment. Just me. I was walking to a client's house to retrieve a dog, but, I, but no other person or dog was around me at the time. I was the one being referred to as the dog, as far as I could tell. And so, when I walked by this trio of people on, this, on South Street this Saturday morning, all of whom seemed artificial to me, the balding man's reference to his dog felt intentionally projected, as though he knew what I was going through and wanted me to feel like a dog. The idea of being a dog, or being treated like a dog, would take more than two years to undo in my brain. That is how suggestive this supernatural experience was. My body and soul was cracked open so wide, mentalists, could have a field day with it. They could do what they wished and would succeed in affecting me. In fact, it seemed as though mobs of con artists and mentalists teamed up in a group effort formed to do just that. Attack an ordinary person, me. Maybe it was to test their skills, prove their wiles among the clan, rise up in the ranks within a world I never knew existed. They were so skilled at their craft, my brain believed I was being spoken to through the owners of dogs in a sadistic way. For instance, if a client of mine said, good girl, good girl, in a condescending tone, it felt as though the client's statement of good girl was intended for me, not the dog. It was patronizing. In fact, I'm certain that in some cases a client would say such phrases then look at me as if to observe my deme demeanor and reaction because he or she knew what was going on and wanted to gauge my response. Sadistically, watch me struggle with having to not identify as a dog. Another oft-used phrase was, don't bark. Good girl, don't bark, be nice. Because of my very opinionated former self, I believe this to be punishment for the metaphorical balls I once had. And with that said, um, I will read another chapter in another video Again, this is Duplicity and Duress, Snap Factories in the Making, um, a very long, arduous, and hard, but a l labor of love. And um, you can click, up, click on the link below to purchase the book uh, to figure out, or to try to figure out what happened in Philadelphia, um, or donate if you can. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.